So I get to say hi to everyone and welcome to our June 2021 Albany Pine Bush Science Lecture. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community who co-sponsor with commission staff our monthly science lectures. And before we, we start today's program as every program, uh, today assessing the status of Fisher in a managed fragmented suburban landscape in Albany, New York, we have two housekeeping notes. First, as questions occur, please please put them in the, the Q&A. You can put them in the chat if you want, but we like Q&A. Uh, we very much encourage you to ask questions. And second, we do not yet have uh, nailed down the July program. That will be July 15th. But if you uh, put on your calendar, we do have a program coming and we'll We'll be posting that both to our Facebook page and to our website, and you can sign up on the calendar as always. So with that, since I can't describe that program, turn it back to Dylan. Thank you, Richard. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. I think it's gonna be a, a great talk about uh, the Fisher in the area. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dan Winters. So Dan is currently a master's student um, at SUNY Albany in the Biodiversity Conservation and Policy Program. Um, before that, he completed a Bachelor of Science degree at Siena, Co Siena College in Environmental Science with a minor in bi Biology. Um, and he started researching Fisher um, in the preserve in 2018. And he's using this research to complete his thesis um, for the BCC, BCP program at uh, uh, SUNY Albany. So thank you so, so much, Dan. Um, and I'll hand it over to you. Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks, Amanda, and thanks, Richard. Um, so yeah, let me start off by just saying thanks to the Albany Pine Bush Preserve for allowing me to do this research. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Dan Bogan for uh, being with me on this journey since 2017 and helping to guide me through the research as well in this long uh, endeavor. So yeah, um, folks, you are all going to be the first group to see the results of our preliminary um, analyses here on the Fisher camera trapping that we've done here at the Pine Bush. So congrats on that. Um, so yeah, this is basically just a run through of the camera trap data that I've collected uh, this winter going into the spring. Um, and we've used this data to run occupancy models to assess uh, fisher habitat use um, as a first step to assessing their persistence in this landscape. So I'm going to run through that and let you know what we found. All right, we're working great. Um, so yeah, just I'm going to go through a brief background on the history of the fisher and uh, what we currently know today prior to this research. Um, so far, past research has shown us that management efforts um, have observed and basically figured out that fishers are vulnerable to things like habitat loss and fragmentation, similar to other species. They've also had a long history of being overexploited mainly through trapping, lethal trapping for their fur and pelts, which is very valuable, um, as well as logging and timber harvests that have pretty much destroyed their habitat and increased their mortality. And because of that, we know that fishers have been nearly extirpated from New York State, along with uh, many parts of New England, um, up or through the northern Midwest and out in the western areas near the Rockies, uh, where they continue to struggle today. Um, Moving on from there, we know that thanks to regulated trapping, which started in the 1930s, um, basically in the early 1900s, everyone started noticing that it was very uncommon to see a fisher. And we were thinking that they were about to be extinct. So we decided that it was time to start to regulate trapping to give them a chance to recover. Um, these efforts were also aided by the regrowth of forest as people were abandoning agricultural lands. Uh, forests were able to regrow and that's what we know so far is that's their primary habitat that they prefer so that allowed them to recover um, the state also did some introductions in some areas to help them recover as well and my fourth bullet point here basically says what i've already uh, emphasized that from what we know so far they seem to prefer 
large coniferous and mixed forests. Um, they don't seem to use other habitats, uh, but that is starting to change as we're seeing. All right, so like I said, um, the conservation concern here, CC. Um, we know fisher populations are valued in North America, as I said, for their fur pelts, which is worth a lot of money, and people do recreationally trap fishers. Uh, in the Albany area, there is a fisher trapping season from October into December. It's very short uh, because this is a carnivorous kind of species that's in low abundance, so they're very easy to trap out and extirpate from areas, so it's carefully managed. And we also know on the ecological side that fishers are predators, they're mesocarnivores, and they're important for maintaining ecosystem function and balance by um, controlling prey spot populations, specifically porcupines. As we know, they're the only ones that are able to uh, kill porcupines. And when porcupines are uncontrolled, they tend to uh, devastate vegetation and trees. And uh, it's important to protect those to maintain healthy ecosystems. So now I'm going to move into the history of the fisher with the pine bush. Uh, they were first documented by um, Roland Kays, Dan Bogan, and Holvensky, I forget his first name about that. Um, but they're the first to document fisher in the preserve uh, while they were studying things like indoor and outdoor house cats um, and other species in the preserve. Um, from that study, we know that they apparently have persisted and possibly increased in their population numbers since the early 2000s. And then from there, we've seen that other studies have gone on board with looking at fishers in this suburban preserve. We have uh, Dr. Scott LaPointe, who did a GPS telemetry study. Um, and then Scarf et al. also used the same data from that study to uh, analyze fisher energy expenditure and movement. All right, so here I'm just going to touch on the conservation mission of the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. Uh, we know that the mission is to conserve the inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens to help save and conserve the endangered carner blue butterfly. And that's done through multiple management techniques, whether it's controlled burns, mowing, and uh, forced thinning efforts to maintain that habitat. Ultimately, our study wants to know if fishers will persist in this managed landscape, uh, given all the activity that's going on and the habitat conversion that is required for this mission. And so basically through camera trapping and then later occupancy modeling, we are trying to investigate how fishers are responding to these predominant habitat cover types within the preserve. All right, so what we have here is one of the cameras that we put out for the study. I'm just going to use it as a quick example. This was a mixed forest site. And then that forest site was thinned out to make it into an open habitat. So this is one example of the ongoing management at the preserve. And here's what it looks like now at the conclusion of our study. It's much more open and it's ready to be converted into another habitat type. Um, over here, we have a porcupine also inside the preserve. So this goes to show that fishers have access to prey, especially the porcupines, uh, where they can control them and prevent them from uh, reducing vegetation and trees, uh, which would be good for maintaining a healthy ecosystem here. Uh, there's another porcupine picture. Uh, this one was over by Trail 7, uh, just south of I-90 in the preserve, if anyone knows where that is. Uh, here we have gray squirrels, uh, another favorite food source for fishers. Um, and fishers are actually able to climb trees and raid the nests of gray squirrels. So that is one of their uh, favorite food sources, if you will. I uh, also had plenty of eastern cottontails on our cameras, which is another potential food source. So there's definitely the potential for them to find a suitable prey in this landscape. And that plays into my point here. Um, Chris Plumer and I actually found this photo on one of our older camera traps back when I was doing a pilot study. Uh, this fisher apparently picked up a robin. I know it's a little blurry, but that's our best guess. Um, so they are able to actively prey on small vertebrate populations uh, in these ecosystems. Um, so that's why we decided to focus more on the habitat use and seeing what suitable habitats they are using within this, excuse me, this preserve. Okay. So yeah, just a little bit of a background on the fisher life history and ecology. 
Um, I took all this information from Roger Powell's book on fishery ecology. I highly recommend it if you do want to learn the ins and outs of fishers in North America, because um, I'll only be briefly touching upon that here so that we can keep moving. Uh, so basically, we know that fishers are one of the largest uh, members of the Mustilidae family. That's basically the weasel family. They are medium-sized carnivorous mammals native to the northern forests of North America. They are sexually dimorphic. Uh, females are typically smaller than males. Uh, males are almost twice the body weight of females, um, which you can see down here. We have the males getting up to 12 pounds, while the fishers females are five and a half to six pounds. Uh, total length, nose to tail, fishers can get up to 47 inches long, while females will stay at about 37 inches if they're on the larger side. And fur colors, typically they start out light brown um, at their nose. As you move back to the tail, they become darker. You can kind of see that in this photo here. Um, I believe this is a female. Um, if you can judge how small they are, if they're slender versus stocky, you can make an educated guess at the gender. Uh, but I wouldn't recommend trying to sex the population um, using camera trap photos alone. Um, here's a picture from Powell's book showing a sedated female fisher on the top next to a sedated male fisher. Uh, so this just helps give you guys an idea of the uh, differences in body size between the two sexes. Over here, we actually have some GIS data I took from uh, Dr. Scott LaPointe's data. Um, this goes to show how territorial fishers are and how they stick to their own territories with not a lot of overlap. The overlap you are seeing is between males and females for breeding, obviously. They'll like to keep each other around for that. But two males will not let their territories overlap with each other. They will try and actually control their ground and uh, just keep a solitary lifestyle going. All right, so a little bit more on the ecology. Um, fisher females can give birth to three kits, which are nursed for about four months. And then on the age of five months, they are dispersing again and finding their own territories to live. Um, as I showed in the map there, home ranges for individual fishers can vary. Uh, for males, they can range from like four square kilometers up to 30. Females can be like two square kilometers up to 15. Um, the studies I've looked at have shown that their home ranges tend to shrink when they're in suburban areas where there's limits as to where they can go. So I think that's why there's so much variation there. Um, my third bullet point here is basically just emphasizing that fishers travel long distances. They are carnivores that maintain large territories that they want to uh, protect from intruders. So they regularly travel long distances to uh, ensure that. All right, now it's time to move on into the uh, results of uh, the camera trap study I did this winter. Uh, here's a picture of one of our cameras set up in the inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens. All right, so here's our research implications. Um, basically, we wanna emphasize that it's important to maintain fissures um, in these ecosystems for top-down control of small vertebrate populations. Uh, the presence of fishers in the Albany pine bush will uh, give us a unique opportunity to study fisher habitat selection um, in a heterogeneic, very diverse landscape, which I'm sure we all are familiar with when we go out and look at the pine bush. Um, there's lots of different habitat types being maintained and um, changed, stuff like that. So we want to see how fishers will select when they're presented with this landscape. Uh, this can also give us insight into how fishers were able to recover this far and recolonize. And then we'll be able to see if they're still vulnerable to certain changes in habitat and uh, obstacles as they're um, endeavoring to recover from uh, being decimated back in the 1800s. And we can also gain insight into whether fishers are still vulnerable, uh, pretty much what I just said. And then from there, we want to be able to um, discuss the management implications and ways that we can control our land management to help aid them rather than hinder their recovery in these areas. All right, so I'm just gonna briefly run through our research questions. Uh, based on what I just said in the previous slide, we are hoping to figure out what ecological features will influence fisher use of habitat patches in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve and the outer suburban landscape. 
um, amid the intense fragmentation of the Albany pine bush landscape. More specifically, we also want to see if fishers will use the managed inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens and the grassland habitats as much as they use the mixed forests and deciduous forests that uh, past literature has shown them to be more acclimated to. And from there, we want to see what habitat features can be conserved and increased through land management in order, in order to support the local fisher population. All right, so these are just the tentative hypotheses that I came up with before beginning this study. Uh, we predicted that fishers will use the habitat patches that have mixed forest cover types in accordance with past literature due to the valuable structures that these habitats provide fishers um, when they're foraging, denning, reproducing, and then their overall ecology. Um, this has often been attributed to the closed canopy coverage, uh, prey densities, and the shelter from large trees that provide dense sites in these types of habitats. Uh, we also predicted that management through tree thinning and controlled burns may be impacting fisher habitat use by lowering the suitability of the habitat types that are frequently managed. All right, so here is the book that we use to come up with our methods for this. Since we are using camera trap data, we decided that we could use occupancy modeling um, to try and model our camera data, turn it into a detection history that would give us insight into uh, fisher habitat use, basically. Uh, this is a screenshot of the program that I used. It's called Program Presence. It was um, pretty much designed after the book that Daryl McKenzie made here. Um, so we used this to input our detection data and then look for habitat uses and uh, correlations with those uses. All right, so just methods continued. Um, occupancy models allow researchers to study wildlife persistence, habitat use, and act as a surrogate for abundance and density measurements. Uh, for our study, we did this to assess habitat use. We did not use this as a surrogate for abundance because of the small area. Um, we knew we would have multiple fishers going to these camera traps. And we, if we tried to do abundance, we'd likely double count or even triple count fishers and not come up with a uh, accurate indices of abundance. Um, we chose to use the single season occupancy model method to examine fisher habitat use um, because we only had one season worth of data. Um, I won't go too far into detail into this, but if you have like multiple years worth of data, there's other types of occupancy modeling you can use. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna focus on the single season occupancy. Uh, requires two types of data, the detection history and then the covariate data. Uh, detection history is basically the camera data that we collected. Uh, these are the occupancy modeling equations. Um, I would recommend going and checking out Daryl McKenzie's book if you want the full details. I'm not going to touch on this too much, uh, but basically these are the parameters we looked for. We have the beta parameter, which is basically a reflecting coefficient of the camera trap data that we collected. And then that gets multiplied. Oh. All right, lost it for a sec. That's gonna get multiplied with the occupancy covariate data and then added on to the other covariate values, which will produce our occupancy and detection results. All right, still going through the methods here. We had a total of 50 camera traps deployed across the preserve uh, and we targeted two, four different habitat types, the pitch pine oak mixed forest, uh, the inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens, the successional northern hardwoods forest, and then the successional northern sand plains grasslands. Uh, we were interested in testing other habitat types out, but our sample size just wasn't big enough to do that, so we stuck with these four. And then when deciding where to place the cameras, we used the technique of random strata sampling. Uh, through a random points generator in ArcGIS to find our camera locations. Uh, we also overlaid a grid system across the preserve and used the random points to basically select grid cells uh, to put our cameras in. And we actually ended up putting the camera in the middle of each grid cell to avoid placing two cameras too close together. And that data for the management units that we based our grid cells off of came from Tyler Briggs. So thank you, Tyler, for that data.
All right, so this is just the general background from our camera survey. Like I said, we had 50 camera traps. Our sampling period ran from January 23rd uh, to March 29th. Um, each camera was allowed to run for a total of eight weeks. So that time period is more than eight weeks, and that's because we staggered it. We broke it up into two sections of cameras, two groups, uh, 31 cameras in the first group and 19 in the second group. Uh, we used the same camera type or brand for all of our sites. That was the Browning Dark Ops Apex camera. And we set them to take five standard shots upon sensing motion or heat, followed by a five second delay between detections. And we set our photo uh, memory size or megapixels to 18. Uh, we did do 16 for some of the grassland sites to avoid having the cameras fill up. Uh, I'll get into that more later. Uh, this basically shows the area size of our four habitat types. You can see the pitch pine scrub oak barrens was 262, the pine oak mixed forest was 479, and the other two uh, habitats were less than that. Um, we we're using the unit hectares. And from here, we basically decided how to distribute our cameras. Um, once we got into the field, we realized that some pitch pine oak mixed forests were actually uh, pitch pine scrub oak barrens, which is why we ended up putting more cameras into the inland pine barrens versus the pitch pine oak mixed forest. Um, but we still roughly had them evenly distributed um, with the availability and size of each habitat. So our, we think our sampling was pretty even. All right, so this map is a GIS file that Dr. Stephen Campbell was kind enough to share with me. Uh, this will give you a sense of the heterogeneity of the preserve and how the habitat frequently changes. Uh, this was back in 2017, so um, it's 2021 now, so we know that management has occurred to change some of these habitats. Um, so it was important for us to ground truth our data upon deploying the camera and make sure we are still sampling in each habitat that we wanted. And here you can see the true camera locations. Uh, this is where we deployed all our cameras, pretty much covered the whole preserve, uh, but made sure we were sticking to the four habitat types that we wanted to check out. Um, so, yep. Um, so here you can see the field methodology or the field setup that we did. On the top left, you can see our Browning camera being deployed and locked with Python locks. Uh, we were very lucky this season, no cameras were stolen, but you typically do wanna lock your cameras when you're putting them out in public preserves because um, you never know when someone uh, will wanna snag one. Um, on the top right is our lure. We stuck to just using a visual lure with no sense, um, no olfactory lures were used in this study. We wanted the shininess of the lure to attract the cameras. Uh, so yeah, we found instances where that does seem to work pretty well for fishers and I'll get into that later as well. On the bottom is a panoramic picture that was used to document the current habitat type. You can see in this example that we are in a mixed pitch pine oak forest. Um, so this just allowed me to document habitat type and make sure we were uh, staying as accurate as possible when assessing our habitat use. Here is an example of our detection history. Um, when it goes into the program presence, um, you can see our survey was for eight weeks and we broke each week up into a separate survey. So each survey had seven days. And in that seven days, we allowed, we basically wanted to see if our cameras could detect fissures at all 50 sites. Um, so these are basically our results. If you see a one, uh, like you do next to site one, that means a fissure was detected in the first survey. And then a zero means no detection. Um, the tiny little dot, it's actually a dash, um, represents missed surveys. So in some instances, the camera would fill up with pictures from blowing grass in grassy areas. Um, so in order to be conservative, we tried to um, just wave that off, make it a no survey, and then move on, basically a null value. I will get more into that later as well. Um, so here is the 11 habitat covariates that we wanted to work on when we're running our occupancy models. Uh, the first five are categorical and they basically are the four habitat types we work with. And in addition to that, we um, used a fifth one, which is forest patch. Uh, that's basically asking if the camera is inside a forest or not. 
And the other ones are basically asking, is the location inside this habitat or not? Um, the last six, um, or the last five, the ones that have dist in front of them is distance to each habitat type. And that was measured out in meters using the nearest neighbor function in GIS. And the bottom one is detection distance. We basically measured out how far the camera could sense movement. Um, so we could understand um, how effective that camera was at each site. And we could also see if that played into the detection probability um, in our models. So here's an example of how the covariates are entered into presence. Um, the categorical ones are similar to the detection history. If the camera meets the criteria for that category, it got a one. If the camera did not meet the criteria, it got a zero. Um, the values on the right that are all decimal points, those are z-scored values based off of the averages of each covariate distance. So we basically took the distances, took an average of the data set and used the average to z-score all our distances in meters. Uh, presence prefers that the values be z-scored so you can better check for variation. So that's why we had to go with that. And so here is the sampling results to our study. We had a total of 2,786 trap nights, a grand total of 262,453 camera photos were collected. Uh, total number of fissure detections based off of our detection history was 52. And the total number of sites with fissure detections was 25 out of the 50. So roughly a 50% um, um, detection uh, based off of our success here. All right, so now again to the fun part, we have our photos here. Um, this first one was taken in the northeast, northwest portion of the preserve. Um, I forget what the row name is, but this is basically site 13 for us. This was located in northern hardwood forest and we did get a fissure just one time at this site. It uh, looks like a female, but um, like I said, you do want to be cautious about coming up with the gender of each fisher at the camera site. Um, this one was our most, was the furthest to the south in our study. This was just north of Washington Ave. Um, it was also in another uh, successional hardwood forest. Um, this was one of our detections of the fisher in the inland pitch pine uh, barrens. So we have them using the managed habitat. You can see this one just kind of cuts through real quick. Uh, over here we have um, another hardwood forest site over by the landfill, the city of Albany landfill. And we had one come through when it was minus seven out. Uh, we also had a coyote come through. Uh, we were able to pick up a couple coyotes as well. They are definitely the top predator in this landscape. And we're back to the fisher. Uh, this fisher decided to check out a tree cavity, cavity, excuse me. Um, and upon shooting some emails back with Dr. Lapointe, he pointed out that number one, they're obviously foraging. They're looking to see if there's prey in these tree cavities. And number two, the fishers are likely looking for denning sites for when they start to reproduce in the spring, the females want to find safe denning sites to uh, raise their kits and uh, avoid predation. Here you can see a neat photo series where the fisher actually climbs a tree. Um, like I said, they make great predators because they can climb trees, they can raid dens. Um, they go through a ton of effort to pursue their prey. And you can see it gets closer to the camera. Um, here's one over by Trail 9. Um, it's in a mixed forest site, um, which is close to the uh, locust clone forest, um, that invasive tree species forest. Uh, this is just east of the power lines that run through Trail 9, if you're ever out hiking there. Uh, same with this photo. This looks like a, uh, a good-sized male. Uh, he seems very stocky. Um, you can see he's actually uh, making his way through the locust clone forest uh, that borders with a mixed forest habitat. Uh, what we have here is a female um, with a very thick winter coat hanging out um, not too far from the Discovery Center, um, again, in an inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens. And here's one of the photos where the fish are actually stopped to check out our lure. If you can look 
um, in the little center of the screen next to the uh, fork in this tree. You can see this fisher actually stopped to take a look at our lure, which was uh, what we were intending to do with that um, setup. Uh, we have the same thing going on in this photo. This was over by Trail 12 near DiCaprio Park in a thick hardwoods forest site. You can see the lure off to your right of the screen and this fisher seems to be going at it. This site also had a coyote um, as well as a neat pick because you got a coyote in the daytime. You can kind of see the uh, cool colors that coyotes have. Um, I threw in a couple of photos of other carnivores just to emphasize that this is a functioning um, wildlife community where there is plenty of competitors um, that fishers have to contend with while they're out foraging for food and trying to survive in this landscape. Uh, here we have a gray fox in the um, sand plains grassland habitat. And here we have a bobcat from what I've heard from folks at the preserve. I'll slide this over. Yep, that's a better photo. Um, this was the first sighting of a bobcat in the preserve. And this kind of caught my interest because um, fishers and bobcats have been known to uh, compete with each other. So I think it'll be interesting to see how the presence of a bobcat or potentially multiple bobcats in the preserve works with the established fisher population. I will point out here that this is the same site, the snow melted away, but this site also has a fisher that comes through and forages as well. So there's more potential research to do there. We have another uh, carnivore on the scene along with fishers um, making their way through this landscape. All right, so figure five here is showing us the detection results um, using this GIS map. Like I said, we had 25 sites that got uh, detections of fishers uh, at least once during the eight weeks of surveying that we did. Um, that's represented by the green star here. All right, so what we have here is the uh, modeling results. I'm not gonna get too into the details here because it can get quite intense when you're dealing with models. Um, so we basically use presence to construct these detection models in order to first figure out what is going on with the detection probability of Fisher at these camera trap sites. Um, so we inputted all of our covariates in as detections and then ranked them by a khaki's information criteria, which is what AIC stands for. And the highest ranking model uh, ended up being the forest patch. So what this is basically saying is that um, sites that were in a forest patch had a higher detection probability of detecting fissure than sites that were located outside of forest patches. So we then took that model and used it to construct our occupancy models. Um, here you can see the preliminary results of our occupancy models as well. Um, you use the same setup. Um, you can see that the top model has distance to pitch pine scrub oak barrens, plus distance to sand plains grassland, plus um, whether or not the site was in a forest patch. And that became our top model as well. So I will get into the interpretation of that later, but now we have our top model. All right, here is the, uh, the, beta ver the beta values I was discussing earlier. They basically show the amount of influence that your top covariates are having on both occupancy of fissure and detection. Um, you can see here that the distance to the pitch pine scrub oak barrens is roughly a three. A distance to sand plains grasslands is roughly a six. And whether or not the site was in a forest patch is roughly a five, which means that all three covariates were having a strong influence on fisher habitat use and occupancy within the preserve. Um, the P1 represents the forest patch detection probability covariate. Um, you can see that gave a small boost to the uh, probability of detection a fisher at our sites. And what, how you basically interpret that is to say, if your site was in a forest patch, they had a greater chance of detecting fissures than if it was not in a forest patch. Um, here we have our detection results split up by our four habitats. You can see they are comparable, but the forested habitat types, the pine oak mixed forest and the successional northern hardwoods 
has slightly higher average detection probability when you take all the sites that are in each habitat and average them together. And then figure six is doing the same thing for the occupancy probabilities. Uh, you can see that the occupancy of fissures in pine oak mixed forest and the successional northern hardwoods uh, is much higher, um, almost a one, which means you in this habitat, you're almost guaranteed to detect them uh, after one week of surveying with cameras. Um, they're much higher than the inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens and the sand plains grasslands. All right, so here is essentially a summary of our results. From this, we can tell that yes, since the 2000, the year 2000 studies and uh, Dr. LaPointe's studies, we see that fishers are still persisting in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. And that the AIC ranking we used for our occupancy models shows that fisher habitat selection across the four habitats is um, increased substantially when we are looking at habitats that are in forest patches and uh, is they're at lower levels when we are looking at habitats that are more open up like the inland pine barrens and the sand plains grasslands. Although we are, did see those habitats get used a couple times in the uh, pictures I just showed you. Well, I also wanted to point out, as I was mentioning earlier, when we dropped some of our pictures down to 60 megapixels, that it was very challenging to run cameras in the some of the windy sand plains grassland sites because the blowing grass was setting them off and causing them to fill up on us. Um, so I would definitely recommend maybe using other detection methods if you want to search for fishers or other carnivores in those grasslands or just check your cameras more frequently because ours are filling up after roughly a week. Um, so it's causing us to miss a couple surveys. All right, so we have our conclusions here. Um, like I said earlier, our top model is showing that um, fisher habitat use is higher in forested types compared to the open habitats, um, like the sand plains grasslands and the pine barrens. Um, we also can tell from our models that there is no large difference in habitat use between the two different forest types that we looked at, that being the pitch pine mixed forest and the successional northern hardwood forests. And as I mentioned already, we know what our top three uh, covariates are for habitat use and detection probability, that being the forest patch, the distance to the inland pine barrens, and the distance to the sand plain grasslands. All right, so just a few more conclusions here. Yeah, we're doing good on time. Um, we have been able to assess that fishers do select for habitats on an unequal basis, show that they are sensitive to the habitat type they are in, and we'll perceive, um, we'll try to stick to certain habitats over others. Um, from this, we are able to conclude that we think that the preserve will be able to best retain their fisher populations by making sure their management is able to uphold a network of forest patches across the landscape, uh, which will allow fishers to continue to find suitable habitat in the complex landscape to forage and thrive in. And doing so will maintain the benefits of fisher predation in these, in these valuable ecological communities. More specifically, they'll be able to pressure the porcupines as well as prey on them, exert behaviors on the porcupine population so that they don't overbrowse on trees, destroying uh, various habitats and uh, degrading the ecological communities there. Um, but we definitely are advocating that the open habitats are bad. We are just trying to emphasize that the forest patch networks be contained because what we did see is the fishers are able to use the open habitats. They just aren't using them on the same scale that they are the forest habitats. So if we're able to keep forest habitats around, they'll be able to use that to get in and out and continue to be the predator and um, provide ecological benefits for this complex and diverse landscape. I also want to emphasize that this is only the first step in assessing fisher persistence. Uh, it could definitely benefit from more research and additional surveys, especially with camera traps. Uh, this will give us insight into future habitat use as the habitat keeps getting changed and managed. 
and will allow us to get a better sense of their responses to land management practices, as well as continuing to see if they continue to persist and stick around in the area. I just wanted to review a couple of acknowledgements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, special thanks to um, Dr. Stephen Campbell and Tyler Briggs for sharing their valuable GIS data with us, uh, which was crucial for helping us create our camera sampling plan, as well as developing our model covariates, as you saw there. It was allowing us to categorize our four habitat types, as well as use nearest neighbor functions to figure out the distance between our habitats. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Michaela Coswell, Isabella Schmidt, and Matthew Porter, um, who have all gone to Siena College and uh, been in the Environmental Science and Studies program there. I just want to thank them for their valuable work in the field. They were able to come out and help me check cameras, uh, swap SD cards, pick up equipment, uh, check lures, do all that good stuff, which is very valuable, seeing as I had to deal with 50 uh, camera traps all running at eight week intervals. And I think that's it. So yeah, um, we can move over to questions now. And or we can go back and look at photos, whatever you guys want to do. Awesome. Great, great stuff, Dan. Thank you so, so much. We've got a few questions coming in. Let's see. Um, Eva asked, uh, uh, does the pine bush maintain game, game cameras and share pictures online anywhere? So I guess that's actually a question for me. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have, we have three game cameras, um, that we move around and we do occasionally put photos, um, on the social media and stuff. Um, or we use them in education programming. Um, but, uh, it would be cool to get them up on the website more, but Let's see, Vicky says, uh, fishers are often blamed for missing cats and small dogs. Do they commonly hunt pets? The year I saw a fisher almost daily in my hillside garden between stone walls, I had few, if any, chipmunks. My cats would watch the fisher from about 20 feet away and they did not seem to bother each other. Would chipmunks be a preferred prey for fishers? Um, great question. And I know from working with my committee, talking with uh, Scott LaPointe and Dr. Bogan, um, that I think it was Roland Kays and Paul Gallery did some scat studies, uh, I think in the pine bush as well. So essentially they're looking at fish or cat scat studies and found that the majority of their diets consist of gray squirrels. Um, so that was serving as evidence that they're not going out and specifically hunting cats and killing lots of cats. They mostly try to stick to natural prey sources um, when they can. Um, generally, they don't like to uh, go after things that are bigger than them. Um, so that they, they enjoy hunting the overabundant gray squirrels that are not hard to find. Um, let's see, Carrie, Carrie asked this question fairly early on. So you, I think you answered it. Um, Carrie, um, if you had a more specific question in relation to, so he, um, they asked, how did you select locations for camera placement? Um, so Carrie, if that if you still had um, a more specific question or if he didn't answer that in his presentation, can you, can you type a question in again? Um, and uh, Carrie also asked, um, did you locate it all based on tracks? Um, good question. I, I did see some tracks there. I took some pictures on my phone. I, I could have thrown those in because it was very snowy out. We had like roughly a foot of snow, more than a foot in some areas. I can definitely see Fisher tracks, um, but we still stuck to placing our cameras randomly within our target habitats. Uh, if we were to just throw one down upon seeing a track that would be biased, uh, we would have biased detection data, which would uh, have bad implications for our occupancy models. So for the most part, we just kept it random. Um, Barb says, who can trap and relocate fishers that are making farm livestock become farm dead stock? Hmm. Um, great question. Um, wildlife rehabilitators are good. Um, DECs into that stuff. I know the ECOs, um, work with wildlife and will remove problematic, uh, animals. So yeah, definitely check with your, uh, 
your governments for that one. Um, I don't know of that being too many, uh, that happening a lot. Um, I will say mostly because fishers are, their populations are very low abundance. As you can see with my map of Skyla Point's data, uh, you typically have like one fisher hanging out from in roughly four square kilometers, maybe two if there's a breeding pair. Uh, but they are low abundance, which is probably why you don't hear about that too much. Um, Sean asks, can they swim? Um, good question. I've seen them walk across frozen rivers. Um, they'll cross streams. They don't have any problems with streams. Um, so yeah, they have some ability to do that. Um, it's probably not their favorite. They are mostly terrestrial animals. Um, the, uh, the American mink is more of a swimming weasel, uh, but they won't hesitate to cross a stream if they feel like they can get through that barrier. Um, Eva says, seems like a rich data set that could spur tons of additional, additional analysis. Is there a plan to preserve the capture plus metadata location, et cetera? Um, yeah, that's definitely in the works. Um, Dr. Boga and I are still hashing out some plans as to what to do with that. Uh, but yeah, as you saw there, we got a ton of other carnivores. Um, I'd be lying if I said we didn't get any deer. We got a ton of deer. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a rich data set that uh, other analyses could use to uh, churn out some more papers, research uh, findings. So yeah, there's definitely some stuff that'll be happening with this data set in the future. Um, Margie asks, um, or Margie, uh, is it common for fishers to be out in the daytime or is it a new behavior for them? Another good question. I like that. Um, judging by what we got in our data set, we, our fishers were mostly nocturnal, um, which is why you saw mostly black and white photos. Uh, they do seem to be up in the early mornings as well. Um, but from what we could tell solely based on our data, they're strictly nocturnal. They are out in the morning sometime. Uh, in a past study, I got one that was out at 4 p.m. I'm not sure why, um, but for the most part, they do. They are nocturnal, especially when in the suburbs. Uh, but we do see some variation, as you can see in some of the photos I got. I think one time I was out in the preserve doing a point count, and I think one got discovered by some birds, which then proceeded to mob it. <laughs> and yeah. so I think... Uh, probably they would rather not be disturbed in the daytime though, <laughs> sounds yeah. like. Yeah, they, um, they like to sleep in trees. So it's not a bad idea to check a tree canopy every now and then or uh, carefully check a denning site. But um, yeah, they're, they're mostly sleeping in the daytime. Uh, Lisa asks, why did you choose to investigate fishers? Um, great question. Um, I know I've been talking to over with Dr. Bogan back in 2017, thinking about doing more with coyotes, a couple other carnivores. Um, but I think we settled on fishers because of the conservation story. This is a, uh, an animal that immediately upon European colonization was trapped out for its fur, had its habitat destroyed, and it basically extirpated. And then um, with regulations and our, a little bit of our help, they're able to recover. And because of that, we start off thinking that they only belong in mixed and coniferous forests far away from people and the suburbs and civilization. And now we're starting to see evidence that maybe that's not the case. They are living right in our backyards. Um, so it really was a conservation story and trying to uh, add pieces to that story to figure out just how much of a generalist this species might be. They're definitely interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Someone says, what are the predators of fishers? Another good question. I had a feeling I was going to get this one. Um, so yeah, fishers are definitely mesocarnivores. Um, so they're designed to take out the small vertebrates. The Right now, the coyotes are the top predator of this habitat. Um, when you just like forget about what we do as human beings and are hunting and all and trapping. Um, so it's possible that coyotes do occasionally go after fishers. That being said, um, coyotes and just carnivores in general want to use as the least amount of energy as possible. Going after a fisher is going to take a lot of effort. Um, and again, like I said, they're low abundance, so they probably don't meet all that often. Um, but if I had to say there was a top predator, it could potentially be a coyote. I know out west you have like mountain lions and wolves. They're definitely the top predators. 
Um, and they, they've been known to give fisher some problems. But like I said, the fishers are just a low abundant species, very solitary, um, and then make use of denning sites and stuff. So the chances of them finding them are very low. So which is probably why they stick to uh, more common prey species like squirrels, rabbits, all that good stuff. Um, Chris says, how important are forest habitats for other predators? Um, very important, especially in suburban areas. Um, carnivores are sensitive to fragmentation, uh, timber harvest, um, removal of the habitat that they get acclimated to. Um, the oddball you could say is coyotes and uh, carnivores that are generalists. Then typically you have your generalist species and your specialists. Uh, so it's more the specialist species that really specialize in certain types of forests. And when those forests get removed for whatever reason, uh, they, they um, decline rapidly and basically leave the area, um, which plays into what we're trying to figure out here. Um, are the forests um, good for the fishers or are we just seeing them turn to generalists that are using multiple different habitats? So, and again, our stuff is preliminary and this is just one step towards uh, getting the big picture, so. Yeah, and that actually kind of feeds into um, Denise's question. She said, interesting work and presentation, thank you. However, it might seem that managing to retain more forested areas for Fisher may conflict with overall management goals to support Carner Blues. Um, and she asked me to comment on that. Um, and yes, yeah, you're, you, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so um, here at the Albany Pine Bush Preserve, we're tasked with restoring and maintaining this inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens. Um, and that is a more rare and a more declining habitat than uh, northeastern hardwood forests. Um, forests, are, forests are doing pretty well <laughs> in the northeast. Um, so Yes, we, I mean, this is something and that's why, you know, we really like to um, work with students like Dan to learn more about these things um, about and Fisher is one of those things that we're really curious to see if they're going to persist on the landscape in the face of our management. Now we're not going to remove 100% of the forest in the pine bush because that just doesn't make sense you know there are ravine areas, um, there are wetter areas. Um, that just don't make sense to try and restore to these pitch pine scrub oak barrens. So those will remain forested. Um, and then there, of course, will always be pitch pine forests to some extent, um, kind of mixed into the pine barrens. Um, so yes, if there was a species that we were concerned with seeing decline in the pine bush as a result of our work, um, it would be fisher or maybe some of the more forest birds. Um, so we're that's why uh, Dan's work is um, and work like his is so important to help us understand, you know, in the bigger context, what's going on. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the Carter, the, the Fisher doesn't have the, the federal status um, that the Carner Blue butterfly does. The Fisher is doing much better than the Carner Blue. So the Carner Blue is, is in need of more conservation assistance at the moment um, than the Fisher. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a, it's a dynamic situation that we're, we're keeping an eye on. And we're very curious to see, given what Dan has said that, yeah, they're seeming to persist more in these kind of fragmented, more urbanized than we thought kind of situations, maybe they will persist on the landscape. Um, but yeah, hopefully Dan's work will continue and we'll be able to answer that. <laughs> Uh, all right. James asks, are female fishers social with each other or are they territorial like the males? Yep. Um, I like that question too. Um, they, they pretty much are territorial. Fishers just in general, regardless of sex, are solitary. Um, and then once it's time to breed, like the coming spring here, um, they basically turn around and start seeking out the opposite sex for breeding. Um, that, that is the only time you'll see fishers being social and having their territories overlap. It's a male and a female are trying to meet up. Um, otherwise, they're completely solitary. Um, would they would they be super aggressive to another fisher if they encountered them? Like, yeah, they've been known to do that. They've been known to uh, kill each other. Um, wow. So yeah, and um, I know 
when fishers, female fishers are raising their kits, it's essential that they protect them from males, even if it's the male's own kids. Um, yeah, stuff like that has happened. So yeah, the males don't, the males are only good for keeping out other predators. Um, their parental responsibilities are uh, not the greatest. <laughs> As is the case with many different species. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Jean says, Dan, interesting study. Would you attempt to pronounce the scientific name for us? Oh, the Cania Panante. There you yeah, go. absolutely. They, they yes. just got moved into that genus fairly recently, Martis. right? It used to be Martis Panante. And then they went back to the Native American name, which is like Pecan, Pecan something. So yeah, that was the reason for the switch. But uh, they could change within a year or two now. Was, the names are always changing. I mean, that sounded right to me. <laughs> yeah, that's the best that I could do. Um, that's the only way I've heard it pronounced, but um, they definitely get fancy. And again, they're subject to change. Uh, Lisa asks, are fishers surplus killers like their cousins? Um, they're crafty predators. Yeah, they, um, the, one of the things they always, they quickly learn as kids is to how to kill. Um, so it's definitely possible. Again, from the evidence we've seen here at the preserve, they're strictly hunting to survive. Um, so yeah, there's more research to do into that, I'd say. Um, so it's possible, but again, that's, that's not really what I've been seeing with my studies so far. Um, they seem to be hunting just to find their food and then they're trying to avoid all the various impacts and uh, effects that are going on in this landscape. Uh, Chris says, could the fisher be primarily using the more open habitats for hunting? Uh, that habit, that habitat there seems to support more prey species in general. Um, that's a good question. And, um, the past camera studies I've done, I've actually got porcupines in the inland pine barrens, um, which could be a reason if the porcupines are denning in the pine barrens, that could be an incentive for the fishers to go out there. Um, so it's possible, I think in order to know for sure, you need to do a GPS or radio collar study, um, and actually track the movements of the fisher and see how long they are foraging and hanging out with certain, in certain areas. Um, I think just getting camera data, like what I got here, will just show that they pass through and forage a little bit, but you're not going to get a sense of how long they stick around unless your camera's repeatedly getting them for multiple series. So GPS collar studies would be better to answer that. They're expensive studies, but they're definitely worth it. Um, Carrie got back to us about his ca uh, uh, the camera placement question. So once the camera, uh, on the camera location issue, I understand the grid and concern for bias. I was curious about once you are in a block, how do you decide where to place the camera? Thanks, so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we stuck to placing the camera in the center of the grid um, or as close to the center as possible, depending on the availability of trees. Uh, and we didn't stray from that criteria at all. Again, we were looking to keep a distinct amount of distance between our cameras, which was 58 meters. Uh, we didn't want two cameras bunching up um, if we could avoid it. So again, we mostly just stuck to our coordinates um, in the field. We didn't try to uh, deviate from those. Uh, Vicky asks, during the trapping season, do trappers need tags to limit their take or can they trap several? Uh, they can trap several. I just checked the, uh, the regulations before starting this presentation. There's no bag limit on them. There is bag limits for Martins. Um, and then, like I said, it's from October 25th to December 10th. So you roughly you get a month. Um, and like I said, it's a low abundance species. So they are careful not to um, remove them, but you can see the way their territories work. Um, you trap one fisher in an area, you've probably just removed the only fisher for like four square kilometers. Hmm. So yeah, but last I checked, there's no bag limits. Um, that's subject to change um, pending additional studies. So yeah. Studies like yours. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, I think we answered Margie's question. Do both male and female tend to the kits? Sounds like males do not. No, the males aren't too helpful with that, other than keeping the predators out of the area. Uh, some friends in the southern Adirondacks said they found the remains of a fawn in a tree crotch. 
Is it possible for a fisher to drag a fawn up a tree? Um, not that I've seen. That's, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I know that fishers won't hesitate to scavenge on a deer carcass. So if they find a dead deer, they will chow down on that. Um, but yeah, I don't really hear anything uh, on the research side about them uh, dragging deer around um, or dragging them into trees. I will mostly take their smaller prey into trees if they can. Uh, Dan says, are they fisher or fisher cats? Can you comment? Um, I've heard both. I think both is acceptable. Um, so I know the literature and the science will stick to calling them fishers, but fisher cats is acceptable. Um, that might be to distinguish them from uh, when you search them in Google or something, because as we found out, it's tough to search them in Google if you just type in fisher. So, yeah, but either one's acceptable. You're good calling them either one. Um, James says, what are some other methods of recording the presence of Fisher other than using cameras? Mm -hmm. We, um, we thought about this before we started the camera study. Uh, you can use track plates. Um, you typically want to use olfactory lures to get them over to a certain area. So they actually step on the plate. Um, I know, um, both Dan Bogan and, uh, Scott LaPointe have done live trapping. So, I mean, if, since you can recreationally trap them, you know, it's not hard to get them into a cage. You can live trap them and then study their bodies, teeth, health, weight, uh, gender, and you can put radio collars on them. Uh, so that's been a long, reliable way. It's just very expensive and uh, time consuming in the field. Um, you also use hair snares. If you're just looking to get genetic samples, you can put uh, gun brushes around trees, uh, you'll probably want to use bait in order to get them to move in the right direction, but it's possible to hair snare fishers as well. So yeah, those four typically work, including the cameras. Um, what's the estimated number of fishers in the pine bush? Um, again, like I said, this is this was such a small area. If I want to determine that with a camera study, I would have to put one sample in each, essentially each home range of the fisher or over like a very large area, like four square kilometers. And then I could uh, do a, an indices estimate um, based off of the camera data, but I wasn't able to do that with this study because of sample size issues and the preserve being so small. So I can't really comment on that. Um, all I can tell you is that we were able to assess fisher presence and absence across the landscape. It's really hard to get those <laughs> population estimates. <laughs> it's hard well, to travel. pin those down. They travel and cover such large areas that, yeah, you got your work cut out if you want to uh, get, gather and estimate the population. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, there, so there's a question about the, the slide. So this presentation, it is being recorded. So this will go up onto YouTube on our YouTube channel. So um, if you'd like to look at the presentation closer uh, again in the future, you can probably find it on our YouTube channel within the next few weeks. Um, we got to edit it a little bit. And um, so it'll probably go up on our YouTube channel within the next two or three weeks. Uh, Eva asks, are there other mustelids in the pine bush? Yeah, great question. There definitely are. I think I had a, a short-tailed weasel show up at two sites. Um, they are, they're like a little bigger than a chipmunk, so they're not very big. Um, so I was lucky that one stopped and stayed still for a couple photos. Um, so yeah, there are, uh, very small short-tailed weasels. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's it. Um, as far as what I've seen with my cameras, um, those are the only two mustelids that I got on them. How do you tell the short-tailed from the long-tailed again? Um, I was just going off of tail size. Okay. Um, so I can show you the photos. Um, that could potentially be something else. Um, but that was my uh, understanding was that that was a short-tailed weasel. Yeah, I, qu yeah, I, okay. <laughs> I question it too. I think we got a photo once that we thought that I mean we have a video of one that was out and about one night when we were out owling banding owl banding at night um and we thought it might have been a long tailed but they're so tricky <laughs> mm -hmm. well they they're fast so if you can make out the blurriness that's that's typically how you can get them but yeah I can definitely say those photos and we can see because yeah I'm not 100% sure what type of weasel it was but it was a small little guy yeah definitely yeah 
one of those. Um, let's see. Um, so kind of along the lines of um, what predators will attack fishers, um, they're asking if the APB ecosystem, Marsha's asking if the APB ecosystem is fairly healthy for those predators right now. Um, yeah, I know, um, especially with coyotes, the coyotes are persisting in um, all four of the habitats that I looked at. And I know uh, past studies by like Dan Bogan um, can speak to that as well. They, the coyotes are well established in this landscape. So they're going to continue to be the top predator for uh, well into the future here. Um, Lisa says, I have stoked in my shed. Is there some way to make my yard more hospitable to them? Hmm. Um, now stoat is just, yeah. stoat is another name for long tailed or short tailed, right? I think so. Yeah. That's, um, a small bodied weasel. Um, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent an expert on those guys, but I know they do like forested habitats and, um, are sensitive to fragmentation to a degree. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you have a forested backyard, you, you got a good chance, but again, um, if you live in a suburban area, that can be tough. Um, so yeah, that's well worth researching. I'm sure there's some good information on the internet if that's what you're looking to do. Um, it it kind of does come down to the habitat you got and what successional state is it, it is in though. So I'd start with that. Um, Dr. Bogan said um, about the cameras, when setting cameras, we have a, a fairly strict protocol for setting cameras to maximize our ability to detect our target species. That makes sense. Um, Carrie says, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Best of luck with your continued research and writing. Um, awesome, thank you. Janice, um, do fisher ranges overlap with pine martens anywhere in New York state? Um, yeah, I know. Um, I actually have reached out and talked to Tim Watson a couple times. He's a uh, biologist with the New York State DEC. And he's done extensive research on both of those species, mostly up in the Adirondacks. So I can point to that area. Their territories definitely overlap there. I went to one of his talks, I think it was roughly a year ago. Um, and he was, he basically pointed out that the Martins are more of a specialist kind of species that rely on certain types of forests. Whereas he thinks his research has shown that fishers are becoming generalists and using all types of different habitat up in the Adirondacks. So yeah, there's definitely some overlap and there's some distinctions between those two species. Interesting. Uh, Lisa says, oh, it's a forested yard, but the internet only has info on in getting rid of them. <laughs> oh. That's the opposite of what they say then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. You do the opposite of what the internet says then. Uh, let's see. Um, James says, are tricky, but yeah, they travel a lot. So there's a good chance you'll see them on a regular basis, but just know that they're going to be off moving around in other areas. Um, but I'm sure there's some tips out there to make them stick around for a little bit if you're looking to get photos or just enjoy them for a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, that. probably not uh, not using um, not using poisons to get rid of your mice or anything, right? Because those kind of those bioaccumulate in predators a lot. So um, it's probably eating mice or chipmunks or something in your yard. So as long as you have those around <laughs> and yeah, you don't chase it off, <laughs> yep. just keep the prey around, and yeah, good chance. Uh, James says, I know you mentioned fishers hunt porcupine. Do they have a special tactic to avoid those quills? Um, they do. Um, it was, it's in Roger Powell's book. If you ever want to read about that for the specific details, but yeah, the porcupine's face does not have quills. So that's the exposed area. So the fishers will do kind of a circular dance around them and look for openings to bite the face, which, uh, is gruesome. And Roger Powell, actually, I think he watched it in person. So he got to witness it, but it's not something you're going to see on a regular basis. But yeah, they attack the face, uh, which doesn't have quills, and then try to flip them over once they're blind. Um, it, it can last up to a half hour. So it's, it's uh, time consuming and um, yeah, not a slow, not a fast process. Uh, wow. But there's a technique. And sometimes they do get the quills, though. So it's not perfect. That seems, that seems like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the, um, 
I don't know if it's the right term, but they, they are motivated to do that because if they do get to eat a porcupine, they don't have to eat for the next two to three days. Uh, that was also what Powell pointed out. So it's a lot of food for them as opposed to getting a squirrel. But yeah, there's risk or reward to, uh, to that process. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat. Nope. All right. Oh, Dr. Bogan says, great job, Dan. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Dr. Bogan. <laughs> Hope you like all my shout outs too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you so much for this really great presentation, Dan. It was really wonderful. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for um, having me. For, yeah, for teaching us about Fisher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anytime. And if anyone has any additional questions, um, I'm sure they can get in touch with you and you can send them my way or something. But um, yeah, I think uh, posting this on YouTube will be useful as well. So that'll be good. Awesome. Yeah. All Great. right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>